Hi, my name is Jo Gibson and I'm a clinical physiotherapy specialist working at the Liverpool Upper Limb Unit in Liverpool in the UK and also a consultant in private practice. As you know, I like to pop on Facebook on a Monday evening uh, for an excuse to geek about all things shoulders. Um, we do some case studies, we look at some interesting clinical challenges, but also potentially any controversies that are out there in the literature. Now tonight, I've got a little bit of a teaser for you. Want to see what your clinical reasoning's like in terms of working out a patient who'd had a five to six year history of shoulder pain and importantly look at any potential things that we can do to help in terms of diagnosis but also importantly what that might mean in terms of our treatment. Now this guy is, let me just check, I've got his letter here, this guy is 43, he's had a five year history of uh, posterior shoulder pain He's been investigated to the hilt. Um, he's a very keen badminton player, but he's not been able to play for three years, um, basically because of his symptoms. He's very specific that it's his posterior shoulder. He can get some radiation down into the arm. Um, his neck is fine. He doesn't have any findings in range of movement or palpation, etc. Um, he was originally diagnosed that he'd got a partial thickness rotator cuff tear based on an ultrasound scan, but there was also some query whether or not he'd got a slap lesion, so a superior labral anterior posterior lesion, where that long head of biceps attaches. And that was they felt that because he had some long head of biceps irritation and his symptoms were very much provoked whenever he was in a 90-90 position. Now, I was actually asked to come in and see this guy by one of my consultant colleagues, Excuse me while I turn off my phone. Rookie error, sorry. My son ringing from university, huge apologies. Um, I will get all this right one day. Um, so yeah, we've got this 43-year-old who's got this five, six-year history of posterior shoulder pain, some radiation down into the back of his arm. Um, he does describe some feelings of paresthesia, again, in that posterior shoulder area. But as I say, nothing to suggest any nerve involvement. Now I get, uh, sorry, any cervical involvement. So I uh, get asked to go into the room and see this guy. He's fed up. He's had physiotherapy for some really good people. He's traveled to see us from somewhere else in the country and he's clearly very frustrated. He's unable to get back to the sport that he loves um, and clearly he's really struggling with anything in overhead positions. Now, when you look at this guy and you look at his range of movement, um, then essentially, oh, sound is cutting out again. Guys, I've got a very, supposedly got a good internet section here. Can everybody tell me if they can hear me? Clearly, it's going to be one of those nights and I'm just going to have to go over the road and start again. Can you just let me know if you can hear this, guys? Sorry. Oh, it's OK here. Yeah, my Internet connection's really strong. So hopefully, hopefully that's just a blip for Karina. I hope so. Sorry, Karina. Oh, good. Excellent. Better now. Well, let me know if things deteriorate. Sorry about that. Um, I can't wait to get back into my house. So hopefully within the next two weeks, I'll be back there. Um, so this guy, as I say, posterior shoulder pain, has some episodes of paresthesia, can't get back to his badminton. In the clinic, when you look at his range of movement, um, he's got full external rotation in neutral, full internal rotation in neutral. When you look at his active range of movement, he's got full range of movement. Um, I like to assess the cuff in prone. I like to look at the ability of the patient to actively rotate through their full range. Now, interestingly, bearing in mind that this gentleman's had a lot of physiotherapy, when we look at him in prone, he definitely seems to have some deficit in terms of his external rotation. So he's unable um, to uh, actively rotate through that full passive range. Now, as I say, he's had rehabilitation aimed at his rotator cuff. Um, he's had a um, rehabilitation aimed at the kinetic chain, bearing in mind his badminton, looking at all those things and building up his capacity. But unfortunately, it hasn't translated into any symptom response. Now, as I say, this guy's been sent to us for a second opinion. And what are the things in his history that make me think maybe there's something else going on here? Well, one of the things this guy describes is a real feeling of fatigue. So he says that if he tries to do anything above his head, he gets a real feeling of fatigue in that posterior area and he just can't sustain that position. And the pain really can be quite uncomfortable. He kind of pinpoints a sore spot at the back of his shoulder. If he presses that, it's uncomfortable. He, as I say, he's had soft tissue release. He's had all sorts of things as well as really good exercise prescription, but he's just not getting there. 
Now, what am I thinking in my head? I'm waiting to see if there's any suggestions yet. Um, we've got lots of people reassuring me that you can hear me loud and clear, which is a huge relief. Um, as I say, I'll be very glad when I'm back home with my normal setup. It's always slightly nerve wracking being somewhere else, but I think we've kind of sorted the internet issue now. So what are you thinking? This guy's got a bit of soreness over his long head of biceps. He's got some weakness in his posterior cuff. No indication that there's any problem with his cervical spine, which is obviously a consideration with posterior shoulder pain. And primarily his problems are with the arm overhead and particularly with his badminton when he's serving and doing overhead shots. He's got a feeling of fatigue. Um, he does get some transient paresthesia. What are the things that you might be thinking in terms of your diagnosis? Now, it, from my point of view, if you've joined us on these before, you might already have a clue what I'm thinking, okay? I've, I've seen several patients with this particular issue, and with this guy, because I'd seen it before, then essentially I was kind of a little bit more on it in terms of what I thought the issue would be. But before I tell you, let's just th see a, a couple more things. Now, again, when we look at him, there's another test that we did, which is called the scratch uh, collapse test. It's not, in terms of its reliability, certainly as a standalone measure, it's not terribly useful. But actually, as part of your decision making, certainly when you've got a patient that you might be querying, there could be some nerve involvement, um, then actually that can be a very useful part of your assessment. Now, it's based on the fact that if you do a scratch over a peripheral nerve and you test external rotation strength, because you get this brief pe period of voluntary inhibition, then you get this collapse or loss of an ability to resist external rotation. So it's quite a cool little test when it's positive and it's very easy to do in the clinic. Now, in my head, I was immediately, and Angrid's there already, thinking this could be a quadrilateral space issue, okay? Now, if we look at the quadrilateral space, essentially that's formed by teres minor, teres major, long head of triceps, and the humeral shaft. Now, hypertrophy in any of those muscles or callus potentially following some sort of fracture can cause compression. Now, it's a very rare syndrome. It's generally caused by compression of the axillary nerve, but also the posterior humeral circumflex artery where they travel through that space. But most commonly, it's in contact or throwing sports, particularly repeated overhead um, and contact athletes. Now, as I say, if you look at the common causes, definitely when you look at what's repeated in the literature, there's no doubt that they're caused um, by hypertrophy of the muscles, as I've said, of trauma, but not just in terms of callus, also in terms of leading to scarring, but also fibrous bands around that area. Interesting, some of the overhead athletes I've seen with this actually aren't particularly bulky, so they're quite slim. And again, if we look at n other nerve entrapment pathologies, sometimes that loss of soft tissue buttress can be a potential risk factor. Now, the other thing you would have to consider in this guy is because he's got a history where somebody has queried a superior label tear we also know that with label tears in the superior labrum, we can get paralabral cysts, but they would tend to take out the suprascapular nerve. If you have an inferior cyst, so if somebody had an anterior inferior label tear, again, you can form these cysts as you get leakage of synovial fluid out of the joint because of that label tear. And again, if a cyst forms over time, that can also cause compression on the axillary nerve. So again, it's very important to know if this guy's ever had any history of trauma or there's anything to suggest that he's got label pathology. But as I say, in this guy, no, there isn't. Now, of course, you'd also have to include, sorry, consider any other kind of um, compressive lesions in terms of tumors and nasties and other things. But again, there's nothing about this gentleman that makes me think that. It's a very mechanical pattern. It's very associated with overhead activity. So what are the other things that I can do in terms of ruling in or ruling out a quadrilateral space problem? Well, this guy ended up having an arthroscopy. He did have a partial thickness rotator cuff tear, but there was no no sign of any label pathology. Essentially, everything was normal. Now, when I look at him in the clinic, what I was really interested at is there did seem to be a little bit of atrophy in the inferior part of his posterior cuff, so more tear is minor. Um, but also there seemed to be some loss of definition in his posterior deltoid. Now, as I say, we had that associated external rotation weakness. Now, as we know, when we look at the innovation um, of the axillary nerve, essentially it innovates deltoid, of course, teres minor, and in 20% of the population, long head of biceps. So again, an associated long head of triceps weakness 
can be an early indication. Now, if you do nerve conduction studies and they're positive, then life's very easy. But again, what you'll see if you look at the literature and certainly if some of the patients I've seen, then actually often it's really disappointing because the nerve conduction studies come back normal and you think, whoa, I've got it wrong. It's not quadrilateral space syndrome. There's no nerve involvement. But we actually can't fully trust our nerve conduction studies, particularly in this population. Remember, we need axonal loss for those nerve conduction studies to show us anything. Thing. Equally, if we do an MRI scan, we'd want to see um, fatty infiltration within the affected muscles, again, to be consistent with a nerve injury. But what we know with quadrilateral space syndrome is actually sometimes we just get transient compression. And so we won't see those things actually on imaging. And so again, it can make us think we've got the diagnosis wrong. Actually, it just suggests we need some other things to help our decision making. Now, the scratch collapse test is one option where you can do a scratch collapse over that um, quadrilateral space at the posterior aspect of the shoulder. But some other things that are getting a lot of interest at the moment are using pinprick and also using a coin at room temperature and body temperature. Now, Anina Schmidt has looked at this in carpal tunnel, um, and it's also been looked at in cubital tunnel, and she's currently doing some work with Rod Patterson in the thoracic outlet population. But essentially, if you do a pinprick over that posterior area of the shoulder, so remember we get innervation posterior shoulder and down into the posterior shoulder, if that is, n if that is positive, then we start to think that there might be some indication. So again, if it's different to the other side. Now, then what she suggests is using a coin. Uh, we can do it at room temperature. That will be perceived as cold. If we put it in our pocket for a little while, then it will be perceived as warm. Now, if basically the sensation is normal on both sides, so it feels the same, there's no difference, then you can be confident you haven't got nerve involvement. If, however, you've got some abnormality in that, then Obviously, we, with our pinprick, then we can start to build that picture. Now, for me, as ever, the subjective history is the most important thing. Have I got a clear history where I've got a suggestion of nerve involvement? And as I say, it's not just paresthesia that makes me think of nerves. Actually, when I look at the patients I've seen with quadrilateral space syndrome, actually, generally, fatigue is one of the biggest descriptors. And this real ache and kind of real inability to sustain the arm in those positions for any length of time. When I've seen in contact athletes, then the common thing they'll say is if they take a hit in training um, or they take a load with their arm in an extended position, they can have two or three days of significant loss of strength in their um, external rotation, so their teres minor, but also in their shoulder extension. It recovers over a period of two to three days by doing all their usual muscle stuff, but then again, if they take a hit. Now, if I'm honest, when I look at the contact athletes I've seen it in, generally they've actually had previous surgery. So they've had latages or they've had revision surgery and arguably one that will just tighten them up and potentially put a little bit more load through those posterior structures, but also they've rehabbed really hard to build that muscle bulk up. If you can see some changes in muscle bulk, then obviously it makes our life much easier. But just remember those subjective features. Now, as ever, we've got to be really careful in terms of um, our differential diagnosis. And of course, you'd want to consider things like um, thoracic outlet, any posterior cord injury of the brachial plexus, of course, our C5-6 uh, cervical brachialopathy, radi radiculopathy even in terms of that posterior shoulder. And if they'd started with acute pain, we might also think of something like Parsonage Turner. But the key thing with this guy is he was very clear that things were aggravated by those overhead positions. Now, as I say, I was asked to review him because he'd seen physiotherapists that I really trusted and I know they'd have had it nailed in terms of all his cuff rehab and everything else. I was pretty confident confident to push for this guy to see somebody who who specialized in peripheral nerve entrapment now what this guy luckily i've worked with this guy before and even in the absence <coughs> excuse me of any um abnormal findings on imaging and even equivocal signs on um if you like our objective testing, he's still been happy to look at the effect of doing a local injection or a, hydro, a local hydro distension, if you like, around the nerve to see if it changes their symptoms. And obviously, if it does, then proceed to do a formal release. Now, in this gentleman, again, he did an injection. He got 100% relief of his symptoms for about a week after that injection, and then everything came back. Now, interestingly, even after the injection, there was an improvement in his scratch collapse test, another test that I didn't mention is obviously you can use tenels, which we'd use in any other peripheral
peripheral nerve. Again, you can use that over that quadrilateral space. But interestingly, those things had improved at follow-up. However, he still had convincing symptomology. So essentially, the peripheral nerve surgeon did a local release. And guess what? This guy now has complete release of all his symptoms. Now, this guy had seen lots of specialists and fantastic physios, and he's five to six years down the line. It's very easy sometimes to write some of these things off as being a persistent pain, but he had localized pain that had a mechanical pattern. And as I say, that fatigue, that weakness, and that kind of impression of some loss of bulk in those specific muscles immediately made me suspicious. So really, I just wanted to pop on here and just talk about him because I'd had the letter back from the consultant seeing him for his postdoc follow-up. And I thought it was a really good story to share um, because essentially it's a, a success story. And the nice thing is with these patients often because they haven't got frank changes in the muscle, they haven't got atrophy, then actually they can make a full recovery. So Angus just asking, I'm sorry, but I hope I'm pronouncing that wrong. That Right, right, even I really am not on my form tonight, am I? Um, what the scratch collapse test is. So essentially, is the scratch collapse test, as I say, originally described in carpal tunnel. It's also been looked at in cubital tunnel, but peripheral nerve surgeons will look at it in other peripheral nerves as well, and hence its application in this particular patient. Essentially. What you do is you test external rotation in neutral in terms of external rotation strength, and you do that irrespective of which nerve you're um, testing, and then you literally do a light, a let gentle scratch over that nerve where it um, becomes peripheral. So if you like, where it comes through that quadrilateral space. So generally, if you palpate, you'll find a sore spot um, in the kind of boundaries of what I discussed. And then essentially, if you do a little scratch over that area and immediately we test external rotation, it will collapse or they'll be unable to withstand that external rotation force. And as I say, it's postulated to be because of a brief period of voluntary inhibition. Now, again, as a standalone test, we have to be honest that its reliability isn't fantastic, but a recent systematic review that looked at its use in peripheral nerve entrapment actually showed that as part of decision-making, when you have a relevant history and other tests to consider that actually it can be very useful. So definitely something to add into your clinical toolbox, not as a standalone, but something to aid your decision-making. Now, as I say, this was a lovely success story. And to be honest, most of the patients I've seen with this actually have done very well with release. And what's interesting, when I spoke to the surgeon about what he found when he went actually in to release the nerve is essentially he found either fibrous bands or he found scarring ar around the area. Now, the one other patient that I've had with this, so I've seen two rugby players, I've seen this guy, um, and the other guy I saw was actually somebody who presented with a stiff shoulder. Now, he was in his 30s, and so immediately I'm very suspicious that it's not a true frozen shoulder. Um, I'm also um, very keen uh, if you like to rule out, there's no underlying systemic things because again, if people present with what looks like a frozen shoulder, what we're seeing now is it can be an early indication of subclinical diabetes or thyroid issues. However, in somebody that young, particularly when he tells me he's got a history of posterior shoulder pain, and particularly when I see some wasting in his um, posterior deltoid and his inferior posterior cuff, I'm thinking perhaps there was an underlying nerve injury because again, if you look at nerve involvement and an, an irritated or peripheral nerve entrapment that persists, particularly um, the axillary nerve and the suprascapular nerve, we can develop stiffness secondary to that nerve involvement in itself. It's a risk factor, particularly in those younger per, per, uh, populations. So definitely something to bear in mind. Um, Val Jones, a great friend of mine, fantastic uh, elbow specialist over in Sheffield, um, says she loves showing the scratch collapse test um, in cubital tunnel to new registrars and look at her like she's practicing witchcraft. It really is quite a cool test. So I definitely advocate having a good go at that in clinic because it's quite good fun. Um, so guys, that again was just an opportunity. I'm sorry, slightly off my A game today. Um, lots of uh, hesitation and initial technical issues, but hopefully we've got it nailed. So remember, Somebody comes to you with posterior lateral shoulder pain, of course you've got to roll out the cervical spine, but if their problems are specifically aggravated in an abduction external rotation or sustained overhead position, 
if everything else has been ruled out. Remember, consider if they've had a history of trauma previously, particularly if it's instability or a fall on an arm that could have caused a superior label tear. Don't forget about those cysts, but that's why imaging in these situations is so easy. Sorry, easy, so useful. So we can look for fatty infiltration, but again, remember the problem often with these patients where it's a transient issue, only aggravated by those overhead positions, often your imaging can be very disappointing in that you can't see anything. There's some new forms of MRI called new MR neurography, which are meant to tell us more about the nerve. But again, in some of these patients, that's been normal as well. So the clinical picture is absolutely key. What aggravates it is absolutely key. But I think as Anina continues to do her research, looking at these simple tests in terms of pinprick, and as I say, that room and body temperature testing with a coin might give us some additional tools that just help aid our clinical reasoning. The scratch collapse test is a real bit of fun. And don't forget your tunnels. Again, if you find that sore spot, think about your tunnels and again, see if that reproduces any of the paresthesia. And don't forget that in 20% of the population that that posterior part of the auxiliary nerve also innovates long head of triceps. So guys, I hope you've taken some useful things away from that. As ever, I'll post some useful resources on the Facebook page and a summary of the key things that I've discussed this evening. Just something to have in your clinical reasoning framework, particularly for patients when you kind of think I'm doing a really good job. They have the symptoms that I've described and you're not getting that carryover or they're having these transient episodes. Remember, it is relatively rare. I've only seen four cases in my career but I do wonder now when I look back if perhaps I missed some cases because it wasn't something I was aware of. If I'm completely honest, the first time I saw this was when I was actually preparing a lecture about nerve injuries. I read up all about it and unbelievably the next day I saw a patient who fitted all the criteria. So immediately I started thinking, well now I know about it, perhaps I'm picking it up. Just something to bear in your clinical reasoning. So um, Monique, Monique's just said, I'm going to try the test out this week. I've got a patient who has been training for a long time now and the pain won't really go away. Just like the patient you said, uh, only has a pain in external rotation. So yeah, definitely something to think about. And again, for me, it's often those patients that you're kind of able to improve things in the clinic and they're not getting a carryover. As I say, most of the cases that are reported are very much in those contact or overhead populations, but it's definitely something to be aware of. Remember, fatigue, sustained positions, those kind of things, again, immediately make me a little bit suspicious. So I hope I've given you some uh, tips and tricks as ever. Um, a slightly shorter Facebook Live tonight. Um, I shall be uh, back again. I won't be here next week because I'm actually doing a webinar next Monday evening, but I will be here um, earlier during the day. So don't worry if you're at work and you can't actually join us at the earlier time during the day. Um, as ever, it will be on the Clinical Edge Facebook page um, and you'll be able to catch up afterwards and then hopefully it'll get um, posted on the YouTube channel as well. So there'll be lots of different ways and maybe even a podcast. Um, David sorts that out, but I'm sure he'll make it available in some way or other. Um, so Angrid, you're so welcome. Um, vaguely remember this condition from one of the previous talks. Absolutely. So if you go back, you will find a previous talk about this, which was with that rugby player who'd had the latage. So that was a previous case, but it's about a year and a half ago now. So it was a really nice reminder when this letter came about this patient. So guys, thanks for your kind comments. I really hope you've uh, found this useful. Again, has ever taken away some useful clinical tips and tricks. And I'll very much look forward to seeing you um, next Monday at a different time. And as I say, don't worry too much. It'll be on Clinical Edge. And then we'll get back to our usual seven o'clock slot on the Mondays after that. So as ever, guys, so thanks so much for giving up some of your precious time to join um, and enjoy your shoulder geeking. See you all again soon. Bye for now.